The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon to everyone in Asia, and good morning and evening if you're connected to this webinar from elsewhere. I'm Kevin Teo, COO at AVPN, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. A special welcome to the many representatives from AVPN member organizations joining us today. Thank you for your continued engagement and support, and we look forward to welcoming you to the AVPN annual conference on 14th to the 16th of next month in Singapore. For those of you who might be new to AVPN, our mission is to build a vibrant and high-impact venture philanthropy community across the Asia-Pacific. And we do this by advocating the venture philanthropy approach, bringing AVPN members together in roundtable and sharing events, and also building capacity through webinars, workshops, and our knowledge center. There are currently 158 AVPN members in our community from 26 countries. We have two speakers for today's webinar on the BOP Hub, Transforming Poverty into a Vibrant Marketplace at the base of the pyramid. We'll start with a presentation from Jack Sim, founder of World Toilet Organization and the BOP Hub, and then Yannick Foyne, Regional Manager of Nutrition Improvement Program at DSM Nutritional Products. For those of you connected to the webinar via your computers, you should see a small widget for the GoToWebinar software and within this widget there will be a box where you can type in questions to the presenter. Feel free to submit questions as Jack and Yannick review their presentations. I will group these questions as they come in and will raise them to our presenters during the Q&A segment. This should hopefully address most of the common questions, but if you would like to contact our speakers later, their contact information will be available on the last slide. And now, without further ado, let me turn over the presentation to Jack first. Okay. Is it okay? Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I'll start. Um, I was uh, I founded the World Toilet Organization to break the taboo on sanitation, which was unspeakable in 2001, and the effective advocacy has been successful. And last year, we managed to get the United Nations 193 countries to adopt our founding day, 19 November as the UN World Toilet Day. That gives a lot of legitimacy to the subject. And along the way, I discovered that the best way to solve the sanitation crisis, which affects two and a half billion people without toilets, is to create a market system to sell, teach them to produce toilet and to sell. So a market economy works much better than giving people toilets. So, that brought me to start the BOP, BOP Hub, which is um, to design business to end poverty. What we are trying to do is to create a platform that could scale up anybody who has good ideas at mezzanine level. That means they are proven ideas that has been working, and then how to bring it to a larger scale, either through scaling their own organization or to let everyone replicate them. So first, to let everybody know the context. The base of the pyramid comprises of 4 billion people who earn less than $10 a day. It's worth $2 trillion. The world today, whole world economy is about $70 trillion. So this past four decades, uh, no, no. In the past four decades, $2 trillion has been spent uh, on foreign aid 
and not much has happened except that the money is spent and the uh, donation is needed for the next tranche. So if you were to continue to think about how the ODA has been um, donating money, the impact has not been very, very good because the every dollar re is spent and then you need the next dollar. So to make something sustainable, we thought if we would to increase the income of the people earning less than $8 a day, which is 4 billion people altogether, we can create a market a place that is very vibrant and when people have more income, the multiplier effect will go uh, to create more purchasers, create more entrepreneurs, the demand will drive supply and a vibrant economy will grow from there. The BOP is an untapped entrepreneurial opportunity. These 4 billion people don't have to rely on handouts. They are entrepreneurial, they are hardworking, and they only need a small amount of training and investment to go to the market. However, the market infrastructure is still very slow, so we have to promote the BOP marketplace to all the commercial organization, the NGOs, the social entrepreneur, the venture philanthropies, the philanthropies and the uh, venture capitalists. These 4 billion new customers, if we view them as customer, creates a wonderful opportunity. The timing is perfect because the ODA, Overseas Development Assistance money is now shrinking very fast. The developed countries are now starting to rethink how they can use their dollar more effectively and investing in poor people to build their own life is definitely the way to go. There are a lot of successful models which we saw in Ashoka, in Ashoka Fellows, in uh, Schwab Fellows, in Skoll Fellows, Synagogues Fellows. So we know they're out there, there are a lot of good ideas and the funds are ready, the human capitals are available. If you look at how they spend their money, a lot of them are spent on food. Now what we want to do is to increase their spending on the other area to increase their quality of life. A lot of health innovators have been successful. One is the Aravind Eye Hospital that do cataract operation in India like McDonald's, so efficient and so low cost and profitable. Riders for Health also um, provide logistics, supply chain, facilitation of motor vehicles, maintenance. This is a very good model that should go to scale. There are many, many more. Vision Spring provided glasses at two dollars, very, very affordable prices to people at the base of the pyramid and eHealth Point have reached telemedicine consultation to people in remote places because the doctors are in the city and consulting with the patient online, assisted by an educated person who is not a, doc a doctor but like a club and he can then um, hand out the medicine as instructed by the doctor. However, all these smart ideas remain island solution as reported by Endeavor study. What we need to do is that since all these ideas are so good, why don't they be copied or scaled up and replicated all over the world? So the BOP hub model is to help everyone who has a good idea to go to market faster, better, greater, cheaper, easier. Because the inefficiency can be solved and our main objective with higher efficiency is to cut waste and create the increased impact. So here is the community of foundation, government, social entrepreneur, NGO, multinational, uh, development bank, 
university, UN agencies, and we want them to work together like a Swiss watch. If these people are all working together, they need to be facilitated by very good matchmaking that are not self-interested, but actually are out there to make everybody much more efficient. And if we pick up just the wellness market, we can pick up um, two sectors, which is the health and the food. So the, new, the wellness dimension requires healthy environment, nutrient, rich farming, and it has primary health care, expert health care, mental health care, nourishment, clean water, sanitation, and personal education. So with this, you can get holistic wellness. What we want to do is to find players to integrate together the drinking water people, the nutrition people like DSM, uh, like uh, World Vision, and sanitation group like World Toilet Organization, medical health care group like Aravin, eHealth Point, and everybody else, so that with the collaboration and integrated delivery, we can piggyback on each other's knowledge, models, and local relationship and distribution channel. So if we look at the treatment right now, is doctors treat people after they become sick. The second part, which is blue, is to prevent them from being sick. So we can bring health and wellness to the doorstep of people through mobile device that is less expensive and very effective in changing behavior because if you don't do that, a lot of people don't actually see a doctor when they are sick. And sometimes they go and see a witch doctor which doesn't really uh, give them the right medicine. So the BOP market requires infrastructure on distribution to cut waste, to increase efficiency, and to leverage what is already out there and we can scale up and replicate it all together. So if you see this effective market approach is to do either your own branch or franchise, joint venture partnership, and scale up market penetration, or to let people copy you as open source and disseminate it. Either way, the whole idea is to create the impact and not to be a hero. What we want to do is within our lifetime, to solve as much of a problem as possible. Our partnership with DSM is start in Cambodia and we do field tests, skill replication, and you will hear a little bit more from Yannick afterwards. What we want to do at last is I want to welcome all of you to the BOP World Convention on the 20th to 30th August where we will bring everybody together and make a big matchmaking event so that we can collaborate across sector and use each other distribution channel and help each other to solve this problem together so that people at the BOP can receive product and services faster, cheaper, better, easier. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jack. So now give us a few seconds as we transition over to put up Yannick's slides. Okay, at this stage I'd like to welcome Yannick, our second speaker to tell us a bit about DSM's work in the BOP sector. Yannick, over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, and first also many thanks to Jack for the invitation. I've always been a big fan of your work, so it's a real pleasure to be with you today. So, so I will start maybe first by, by presenting DSM uh, on slide one. So as I'm not sure many of you have heard about our company, since we are a B2B organization. So just in a few words, so DSM is a global science-based company which is mainly active in life sciences and material sciences. 
So we work in pharmaceuticals, in engineering plastics, in materials, medical devices, personal care, and also in human and animal nutrition, which has now become the faster growing business of DSM. So I will be focusing today mainly on our activities in the human nutrition and health. And in particular, I will be presenting the approach DSM is taking to improve the health of the bottom of the pyramid. So the human nutrition business unit of DSM is uh, supplying vitamins and minerals, so what we call micronutrients. Uh, we also supply other nutritional ingredients like lipids, mainly to the food and supplements industry, all the big names that you can think of. In Asia, our regional office is based in Singapore and cover Asia Pacific at the exclusion of China. So that's it for the general overview of DSM. Uh, we can come back if you have any questions later on. So now back to our focus on the base of the pyramid and how DSM tries to improve the nutritional status of the BFP. First, maybe just a question that you may have in mind. So what does DSM stand for? So uh, just to, to answer your curiosity, so DSM uh, was founded at the beginning of the 20th century, and it used to stand for Dutch State Mining, DSM being a Dutch company. Uh, so that was where, at the time when DSM core business was mining. But now what we prefer to say is that DSM stands for doing something meaningful. So that's the approach that we are taking. And uh, as you can see on, on the first slide, DSM is committed from the very top of our organization at the management level to really improve the lives of people and to try to offer them a brighter living. Uh, so whenever you listen to our CEO, Faike Sivesma, at uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos or, or any similar gathering, you will always refer first to the impact uh, of, of DSM products, and in particular, our vitamins and minerals. We'll have on all the vulnerable population at the bottom of the pyramid. That was, that's really what matters to him. Uh, he received for all his work uh, the UN Humanitarian Award of the Year in 2010. Uh, DSM is also frequently in the top sustainability ranking. And we have been highlighted in several case studies on the Harvard Business Review. So since 2007, we are also very proud of our partnership with the World Food Program, which is very often showcased as one of the best examples of a public-private partnership. So just to, to give you a few more insights on this, within this partnership, we support the World Food Program with product development, uh, with technical expertise, and we also donate premix of vitamins and minerals for fortified products. And since 2007, we can say that over 15 million of uh, World Food Program beneficiaries have been able to benefit from new or improved fortified food products developed by our partnership. So that's quite an achievement. But what I really believe makes our company different and stand out from the competition is that we do not call this CSR, but we, call we prefer to call this a shared value approach. So DSM really believes that in order to achieve sustainability, we have to create value for the company and at the same time achieve economic, ecological, and also social benefits. So that's the approach we are taking. And we believe, and we also regularly encourage our customers to follow this road, is that companies should be active, not only in uh, social issues, but also in, in, so in a combination that allows positive social change and corporate and financial sustainability. sustainability sorry. So in order to achieve these goals, DSM has created the Nutrition Improvement Program, what we call NIP, which are managing for Asia Pacific. So in a couple of words, so the goal of NIP is to respond to the challenges of improving nutrition for the BOP in three ways. First, we develop products for specific target groups and needs. So in order to do this, we work with cross-sector partners to develop sustainable nutritional solutions that will improve their micronutrient status. Uh, we develop specific solutions for the first thousand days of life, so pregnant and like women and also children uh, from six months of age to two years of age. We develop specific vitamin formulation according to the deficiencies per country and so on and so on. So these products are then used uh, for government and humanitarian programs, also for school feeding programs, but also for the commercial sector with our customers. So we always try to make sure that we respect what we call the three A's rule. A product for the best of the pyramid has to be affordable, accessible, and also aspirational. So currently, 
uh, so many overlook the significant market that exists at the BOP because we all believe that BOP have low purchasing powers. But this is, this is changing. So as we all know that the bottom of the pyramid is rising, and millions of BOP customers are, will be joining soon the middle class and will have more purchasing power. So if you are a B2C brand, I'm pretty sure you, I believe you want to make sure that BOP knows and enjoy your products before they move up in the pyramid. So that's why we try to work closely with our customers to engage them in developing specific products for this target population. Something else that we do, we also support what we call staple food fortification programs, uh, which means we fortify staple food like rice, cooking oil, flour, sugar, uh, in order to provide key macronutrients without necessitating a change in the diet of the population. This strategy is usually seen as the most cost-effective approach to improve public health in a sustainable way. So in order to achieve this, we work with industry, with the UN, and also the public sector to deliver this fortified staple food to the population. Last, and I will focus on this today, so we develop new sustainable and inclusive business models through shared value cross-sector partnerships. So the end goal is to make sure that the BOP can access nutritious, affordable products, which will then have an, have an impact on their health. So we work very intensively with local companies, with NGOs, and other organizations on local solutions to bring top quality nutritious food and tasty products to the market. And of course, at the same time, we make sure that these products are affordable, aspirational, and accessible to low-income populations. So I believe that DSM completely shares what Jack just said, Jack's vision, that the best way to go is to explore the connection between several sectors and source novel solutions so that we can all together transform the value chain and improve the health and wellness of the BOP. So moving on to slide two. So I've listed here some of the GSM uh, NIP key projects in the Asia-Pacific region. So I will not go into detail for each of them, but I would be happy to answer any questions if you have after uh, my presentation. So first, GSM and World Vision uh, entered in a global partnership in May 2013, last year. Uh, the goal of this collaboration is to leverage on each other's expertise to contribute to reduction of stunting among 165 million of children under five before 2016. So World Vision, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with this organization, is the largest NGO in the world. They are very strong in advocacy, in education, in awareness raising, and in programming. GSM brings its own strengths in terms of technical expertise in product development, knowledge of the supply chain, and also our connections to the private sector, our customers, and our deep knowledge of nutrition science. Just to give you a concrete idea of uh, the first implementation of this partnership, uh, DSM is one of the core partners of the One Goal campaign in collaboration with World Vision, with the Asia Football Confederation, and with GAIN, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. So the objective of One Goal is to, revelate, so to leverage the power of 1.4 billion of Asian football fans to start a movement which will be driven by football to improve child nutrition. So this 10 years campaign has three main targets, to contribute to the reduction of malnutrition among children below seven, to increase the number of adolescents who adopt a healthy lifestyle, and also to increase grassroots football activities in Asia. So for that, we'll be partnering with uh, diverse organizations, uh, all the football federations in each country of Asia. Uh, we also recently announced a partnership with the English Premier League. So just listen up, you can have more information on whatgold.asia. Uh, you should be hearing from us more on this very soon. Another project that I would like to mention is Kebal, uh, which was started a few years back in Indonesia in partnership with the NGO Mercy Corps. So the idea of Kebal is to prepare healthy and fortified home-cooked meal every day in cooking centers uh, in low-income areas of Jakarta, and to deliver this healthy cooked meal through street caps. So we try to position Kebal as a social enterprise, and Kebal uh, is now known for delivering through street carts the safest and most nutritious street food in Jakarta, obviously with an affordable price point. The last project that I would like to highlight, and I will spend a bit more time on this, is the ICA project. So ICA is the largest women NGO in Indonesia and uh, is part of a much larger Muhammadiyah organization. 
So ICR takes care of kindergartens, nursing schools, and even hospitals. So so far in Indonesia, they take care of over 250,000 children. So just to give you, so that's my last slide, sorry, that's my last slide. Uh, just to give you a bit of a story, uh, so a bit of a background of, of some of these projects. So the story is the following. So GSM partnered with Indofood, uh, one of the largest food company in Indonesia and one of our customers, uh, to develop a fortified snack for school kids, which will be positioned at an affordable price point for the Bedrock Pyramid. So Indofood sells this snack, which is called Govit, in traditional outlet, traditional wawu, uh, in Indonesia for uh, the amount of 500 rupiah, which is the equivalent of 5 cents of US dollars. Uh, the sales are quite impressive, and meaning that there's a huge demand for this type of product in Indonesia, clearly, and I'm pretty sure in other countries in Asia. Uh, we then offer the possibility to ICA to work with us uh, so that we can help them to improve the, the nutritional status of their school kids, to give them access to more nutritious products, and also to combine this with an education program on nutrition for children, mothers, and teachers. So all together, Indofood, ICA, and DSM, and DSM we developed a six-month pilot program with 30 schools and 2,000 children in Jakarta. Every day during the first three months, each child of ICI schools will receive one snack from the food for free. They will also have access to one article per month on vitamins in the Asia magazine for children, and we also develop specific training manuals for teachers so that they can so it's a teach the teachers program, train the trainers so that they can then teach the kids about the importance of nutrition. During the first three months, we measured the knowledge of nutrition the acceptability of the product, and also, to a lesser extent, behavior change. So I'm saying to a lesser extent because during a six-month part of the program, it's very difficult to have a real efficacy study. Uh, that can be done over maybe one year, one year and a half. Can. Uh, during the last three months of the pilot, the schools will then be divided in three groups. One will be getting the stack of free. Another one will have to pay an increasingly high price until we reach the retail price. And the last group of schools will have to pay retail price from the fourth month onwards. So this is a way for us to test the willingness of the parents to purchase the snack, and also to test a future business model and distribution channel uh, for the food after scale up of a pilot. So just to, be, to summarize our business plan here, GSM sells vitamins to the food. Indo food sells large volumes of snack to at the ICI schools. The schools then, then sell the snack to the parents at a smaller price than retail and make some profit out of it. The profit which will be reinvested in building the distribution channel and also in other social projects. The children obviously are the main, are the main beneficiaries. They get access to healthy food fortified with vitamins and minerals for the same price they would pay for, uh, so if they want to buy something from the street, try to, just try food from the street. In addition, they also get access to an education program on nutrition. So this is typical of, of a project that we're trying to replicate in other countries, uh, the project that Jack mentioned earlier uh, with Bob Hub in, in Cambodia. We are trying to take a similar approach, a shared value approach, uh, with another so industry partner. So that's really the way that DSM wants to, to make things move forward, to work with like-minded partners coming for all the sectors to make sure we improve nutrition of a better pyramid. So up to you, Kevin. Okay, thanks a lot, Yannick. And thanks for submitting your questions. I have one to kick us off for, I guess this one would be Jack. The question is, how will the BOP hub help organizations and, I guess, in this case, social enterprises scale up their efforts and their activities? Okay. Thanks for the question. Um, the BOP Hub idea is integrated delivery. So, for example, if you have a very good model but you want to scale up, you might need money. So, bringing funders, whether it's philanthropies, patient money, or venture capitalists, it depends on what stage it is, will take your model and go out there and look for the right people for you. If you want distribution, you need to go out to find who are the people who are willing to take your model and distribute it 
in their own location where they already have an existing distribution channel. So that is another uh, service we can match for you and we'll do intelligently so that sometimes it is not just one service but three or four different parties integrating together. The other is you might need to buy things cheaper than you are buying right now. So for the procurement, we will collect similar type of needs and see if we can redesign things to be a little bit more common. So we go to the supplier and get the price that is cheaper, better than your current level by a co-buying process. You might also need back office services because your core competence is out there in the implementation on the entrepreneurial side and you don't want to be bogged down with website issues and legal issues and um, back office issues. So most of social entrepreneurs are not very big on the back office. So this could be another service that we could help out. What we want to do is to find the people who can do the different things and integrate them together. The university could also do design, uh, uh, do research. The um, designers can do design. There is a lot of people who already found answers to the question that you might have. And so this is the way I think if people collaborate rather than to be in silos alone, then answers can be found so much easier than if they keep on trying to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. I, I definitely like the, the approach that the BOP Hub is taking in terms of being open and collaborative and looking for win-win situations for the various partners. I think in, in your slide earlier, you mentioned a collaboration between you and BSM in Cambodia. So perhaps I can uh, ask Yannick to tell us a bit about the plans for Cambodia and also get some uh, uh, perspectives from, from Jack on that later. So Yannick, can you tell us a bit about this uh, collaboration between DSM and the BOP Hub in Cambodia? Sure, so definitely I can tell you more about this. Uh, so, so basically the idea be, behind this project, and I'm very excited with it, is to, to replicate the business model we are setting up in Indonesia with ICR in Cambodia. So in Cambodia, the Hop Up is very strong there and in terms of being able to access communities. Uh, DSM is trying to, to connect with a few of our customers. Uh, big MNCs, but also local companies from, from uh, Cambodia and also Vietnam, which are interested in uh, distributing new nutrition solutions for BOP. So the idea behind this is really to, uh, to use all the partner strengths so that we make sure that BOP in Cambodia get access to more nutritious food. So BOP Hub has access already to a self network there, uh, which has very deep reach in rural areas in Cambodia. Uh, we are working already with a couple of different private sector organizations to develop specific products for targeting population. In this program, it will be mainly focusing on young children uh, from six months of age to two years. Uh, so we are developing specific vitamin formulation as well so that we can so we target the major deficiencies in Cambodia. And we will start by a pilot program like we do in Indonesia. Uh, that's obviously the way to go. We want to test whether or not this business model could be sustainable for all the organizations involved. And uh, but given the strength of uh, each organization, I think that we should that should be a very interesting project to work on and it should be quite successful at the end. So but we are still in discussion with BOP Hub. Uh, we are hoping to, to start the project uh, after the summer this year. Thanks, Yannick. Jack, would you like to share a bit about the Cambodia tie-up? Yes, I think that uh, this is an example of a tie-up. Uh, also, I think if we are able to be successful in one location, then we could also open it up to several other locations. The idea is that if you look at the mom and pop shop uh, in the past, we always have a little town where you have a shop that sells electrical appliances, another shop that sells shoes, another shop that sells 
uh, textile where you go home and sew into clothing and you have different different kind of mom and pop shop very specialized what happened to this shop eventually is that they become supermarkets and then later on mega mart and hypermart so you know that the reason they become supermarket is because it's inefficient to operate in a silos similarly in the BOP market is the same if people would collaborate together, then they would move from a mom and pop shop operating overhead model into a collaborative model, more like a supermarket. And I think that uh, if we were to not think about being a silo, we actually can be much more efficient. So the BOP Hub idea is to bring first a face-to-face -face meeting in Singapore in August for the BOP World Convention. Everybody is invited. Please join us there. There's also a exhibition element. So this is the first time there's an industrial show because BOP is 4 billion people. If there's no industrial show, there's no industry. Thanks, Jack. Uh, the next question, I guess, could be directed at Yannick. And it's about DSM mm -hmm. and your operations. So being a large global company with many different product lines and services, how do you position the BOP as a business opportunity internally to get the kind of buy-in to help you further your efforts and your plans? Yannick? Sure. That's actually, that's actually a great question, Kevin. Thank you. Um, so I will be uh, uh, talking about nutrition only because I mean obviously for the other business of GSM, I mean the BOP is, uh, is not our core market. But here, I mean, uh, so given the data and the numbers that Jack mentioned earlier in his presentation, there's a clear market for our customers, uh, and they have to try to save market share right now and not wait in 10 years. Uh, what we are trying to do internally is that obviously the numbers are here. Uh, India, Indonesia, uh, the population is still huge. In the SM business, we also try to fight malnutrition. And, the, and usually, when you have a huge population, you have also high rate of stunting and uh, micronutrient deficiencies. So for us, the business case is clear. That's why we try to work with our customers to convince them to, that, they can, that they have to engage uh, and develop specific products for this population at an affordable price point. Uh, it's easier, I have to say, with local companies than with a large with large entities, uh, they understand maybe better the market and they are more flexible and more willing to develop similar products. Then back to your question, how to convince internally and DSM? Uh, to be completely honest, I have to say it's not always easy uh, because obviously, I mean, uh, when you when you think about BOP, you cannot get the same margin uh, than you can get from uh, working on the premium market, but the numbers are here. And it's a clear business case for GSM. And for us, working with the BOP is a way to address, at the same time, both our business goals, but also social goals. So usually, that's the approach that I'm trying to take, is here, working in this country with this project and this company, we can meet this set target, but also we can make sure that we improve the life of this number of people. Uh, that's usually a pretty compelling argument. Okay. Thanks a lot, Yannick. A uh, question maybe for, for Jack on the BOP Hub. How will you plan to run the matchmaking service that you have in mind? And how will you perhaps derive revenue to sustain the hub from there? Yes. So the, the BOP Hub um, is having the mission that we should be able to earn a fee by making the current expenditure lower for our clients. So if things become cheaper, faster, better, easier, then there is a, a split in the additional value, not the current. So uh, in terms of the conference, there's some conference fee, and uh, there's some exhibition. The first year, we are planning to do a break even, and we're happy about that. We've got some government grants support for this event and the rest we have to find ourselves. Um, in terms of charging a fee, 
if it was a, a simple uh, job, it's free of charge. Every delegates that come to the BOP World Convention will be giving will be given a two thousand dollars service package, which is free of charge for a year. So we will be your secretariat service introducing people. All these are simple tasks are free of charge. But if you were to require us to go more in depth and to uh, do market study implementation, doing more in depth analysis, then we'll have to think about what are the time span, and it will be mostly on cost recovery. What we want to do is not uh, to think about the profit motive over the mission. The purpose is if we can create a culture of collaboration that people do not uh, people put aside their own organizational ego and come together towards a mission that certainly can be cheaper, faster, better, easier. I think eventually this culture will spread and everybody will start to see that collaborating is much more efficient and much better for them than uh, being alone. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jack. And perhaps switching to specific details of the project in Indonesia, and Yannick would like your input here mm -hmm. around the um, Aisha project. How long do you think it will take mm -hmm. for the community to fully embrace the importance of nutrition such that your initial intentions and effort sort of pay off in the long term? And is there an issue around potentially an over-dependence on, on this particular snack that you are introducing into the community? How, how do you sort of think, think about the potential, I guess, moral hazard in that situation? Sure, no, that's a good question. So uh, our plan, so the, the six-month pilot has been a bit delayed for, for various reasons, uh, floods and, and and other reasons, and we should be able to get the final results of a pilot uh, somewhere around June this year. Uh, the idea is then to expand and to, to try to scale it up, so basically, so that we make sure that you, we reach as many children as possible in Indonesia through ICR, uh, is the following. So first, we want to develop new products within the food, uh, meaning breakfast products, lunch meals, ready to drink, because it's clear that uh, the children are getting bored of eating the same snack every day. That's completely understandable. Uh, we also want to make sure that we expand the, the nutrition program, the nutrition education program. Uh, for that, we have we have entered discussion with CIMIO. CIMIO is the Southeast Asian Ministry of Education organization. They will help us to uh, to build stronger nutrition curriculum and to expand it to all the schools in Indonesia. So that's, that's the approach we want to take to make sure that the community embraces the project and uh, really take ownership of the project. But I can already tell you, I, I, I went to uh, some of the schools uh, just to witness the, the distribution of the product and, and the education component. I was really surprised, really happily surprised to, to hear how much uh, the parents and the teachers were looking to get access to more information on nutrition uh, so that they are able to understand what they need to do to improve health and, uh, and to, to make sure that their children get access to uh, their daily requirements in, ter in terms of macronutrients. It was very really striking for me. And uh, so in the food also got great marketing sites in terms of how the children were using the product. Sometimes they were just pouring it in their mouth. Sometimes they just decided to, to mix it with milk or to put it in a microwave. That gave in the food other ideas to develop new products. So we think that for all the partners, there's a clear, um, it's clear that we all want to go to scale up to make sure that we expand to all the 13,000 schools of ICR in Indonesia. And, um, and it's clear also that what we want to achieve with this is we want to show this to the Indonesian policymakers, uh, so that they see this as an interesting business model, so maybe, which could be replicated to the Indonesian public school systems. So that's the long-term idea of this program. Okay, thanks a lot, Yannick. And, and it's like, it seems like we are sort of early days in terms of experimenting with new models. 
of not only business but collaboration. And I'm sure there are many challenges as well as lessons that, that, that we can share. Uh, perhaps I can turn to both our speakers to talk about some of the, the key issues and challenges that they have encountered so far in terms of dealing with the culture, the economic issues, government or governance issues. You know, please, please share with our audience what, what you've encountered so far. Uh, Jack, would you like to start first? Yes. Uh, I think that in terms of uh, operating alone, a lot of organizations either are very used to it or uh, at least multi, uh, bilateral with one or two other organizations. That's also common. But to be able to open up and uh, partner with multiple partners, it requires a very confident organization. So usually, uh, we find that you can divide the community of NGOs and social entrepreneurs into those who feel very confident and want to scale up beyond their current outreach and the other ones who are uh, a little bit worried that uh, they might become uh, lost in the jungle if they join a big uh, collab uh, consortium. And I think that uh, the, the, the back wind is going towards collaboration and more and more people are seeing the value of going together. So I think that the BOP market at this stage is at, a, at a, a turning point where the ODA is now getting smaller, very less money from uh, countries donation and they want a bigger bank for the buck. Uh, the philanthropies and the venture capitalists saw that this is the future market. I mean if you look at something like Myanmar right now it's, it's very hot. I think we need uh, to build the culture and slowly people will feel very comfortable. Of course there's a person to person uh, chemistry People, when they meet face to face, they chat a little bit, they understand each other philosophy, they look into their eyes and they say, I like this guy, and then they can collaborate better. It's not possible to ask for collaboration on paper when people don't meet each other. Yeah, this I think is uh, important that we have events like the BOP World Convention. Thanks, Jack. And, and Yannick, perhaps you can share perspectives on, on your side in terms of challenges encountered so far. So, I mean, for us, the clear challenge is uh, if we, we want to, to make sure we engage with all the key players, basically. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to engage with policymakers, and that's one of the key challenges that we have to, uh, to take care of. Uh, so, in, in Indonesia, for instance, with this project, and Jack mentioned Myanmar as well, uh, we want to make sure that we include all the partners in this, because all the partners have a clear role to play. So far, the public sector is a bit, uh, is a bit difficult to engage with, DSL being a private company, obviously. Uh, we are sometimes accused of having our own private agenda, which is understandable, uh, but that's why we also want to work with civil society organizations like World Vision, ICR, Bob Hub, so that we can all work together to convince the policymakers of, uh, of the interest of addressing issues for the OP. Okay, thanks a lot, Yannick. And here's a question around measurement and tracking towards expectations. Uh, and perhaps for both Jack and, and Yannick, how do you know you have achieved what you have set out to do? And how do you measure your, uh, how do you track towards your, your respective goals? And how do you account to your investors and funders along the way? So, Yannick, you like to go first? Sure, pleasure, Jack. Uh, well, it, it's, I mean, for us, it's, uh, it's a question that we respond and we try to address before even starting a project. Uh, we want to make sure what are our KPIs and what will be the deliverables uh, uh, that that's the only way I can convince my management internally to invest in such projects. Just to, to give you a clear, concrete example of ICA, uh, here one of the key, uh, key KPIs is sales. If 
we managed at the end of the pilot to uh, to convince the parents to purchase the snack. Uh, that means that this uh, this network of schools, this NGO, could be a sustainable distribution channel for for healthy fortified snack. If the cells are not there, there then we will not scale it up, and that's clear. So another clear KPI is also whether or not we manage to raise uh, knowledge on nutrition. Uh, with ICR project, we started with uh, baseline. We will be measuring with uh, Q&A at baseline, three months and six months, asking simple questions on nutrition and vitamins to try to understand whether or not the knowledge of nutrition has improved. That's also another clear KPI for us. Okay, Please, Jack, go ahead. Yes. So I think that um, what we can say is that before the collaboration between parties, uh, they would be performing according to what is their current level. And after the collaboration, we can measure the difference. And depending on uh, whether it's dollars made or life safe or improvement or policy changes, those are the typical measurement that we can uh, use uh, to measure the, the differential between before and after. As for funders, they usually come together with a well thought out um, expectation with KPIs and uh, depending on who they are again, uh, we have to follow those uh, expectations uh, or exceed them. So I think that in in principle, if you were to think how would uh, two or three or four organizations find value collaborating, it has to be very good fit, a good flow that uh, one can extract resource from another, and then the remainder is the, how their relationship and chemistry can continue. Uh, there will be always some kind of kings in the beginning, working relationship, misunderstanding, and those are the things that uh, in the beginning needs a lot of uh, coordination. The further on, I think we will have also a lot of social entrepreneurs who are not often online. Uh, you will be surprised that they could be online maybe once or twice a week. And those are the kind of gaps that we also would uh, be able to help to plug while they are off. Okay, great. So thanks for your questions, everyone. I think we've reached the, the, limit, the time limit for our webinar. Before we close, I would like to ask Jack to tell us quickly a bit about what's coming up for the BOP convention and to share that with the audience. Thanks. So at the BOP World Convention on the 28th to 30th of August in Singapore, we have a estafeta uh, that leading uh, all the matchmaking event of this uh, water and sanitation community will be done in Singapore. We have the Gates Foundation, Euro Money, Aqua for All, uh, and World Bank, WSP, bringing the entrepreneurs into Singapore. So from there, we are going to match them with people outside the water and sanitation sector, so going into wellness, nutrition, medical devices, lighting, education, low-cost housing, cook stove. Um, we would uh, also expect to be exhibiting products and services that are available there and also to have uh, procurement services for people who want to buy their things cheaper, faster, better, easier. So the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore uh, Taman Shan uh, is coming to open it and it brings the level of the meeting to a very, very high level of legitimacy which attracts the rest of the people as well. Sir Fazil Abed of Brad is um, the largest uh, social entrepreneur in the, in the world at uh, uh, Bangladesh and then we have uh, the top guru Paul Pollack who started IDE and now is running multinationals like the BOP on water, healthcare, and the rest. Uh, we also have uh, a 
of course, uh, DSM and um, World Vision and a lot of other top leaders who are coming to share and match. Uh, this is not a three-day talk shop. This is a phase meeting of a continuous process of collaboration. So after the event, we will continue to help you find your partners until the next year event that we meet again. Excellent. Sounds exciting. Mark your calendars for 28th to 30th of August in Singapore later this year. So Jack and Yannick, thanks again for joining us as panelists for this webinar. And to everyone, thanks for participating and your questions. Once this webinar closes, you'll see a small widget popping up that will ask you some uh, basic questions around feedback for the webinar. So please send us your, your thoughts and we hope that uh, you can join us for the next AVPN event. Bye everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.